Hello and welcome to another Spotlight session here on the Mainframe Summit. I'm your host, Stephen Dickens, and I'm joined by John McKinney from BMC. Hey, hey Stephen. John. How are welcome. you? Welcome. Thank you. Always great to have you on the show. So for the listeners and viewers who don't know what you do for BMC, maybe let's just start there and position your role. Absolutely. I am the general manager of BMC's mainframe business unit, so that means I get the pleasure of working with and supporting and leading the uh, over 1,200 people within BMC that are absolutely focused on helping our customers have more success with their mainframe systems, development, operations, the whole enchilada, as we say. <laughs> the whole enchilada, exactly. I love it. What a great way to describe it. So we're obviously chatting as part of our mainframe summit that's airing on the 8th of April, a moment in time to capture and really sort of look at where the mainframe is in the context of the hybrid cloud landscape, what we're seeing in AI, where people are on their digital transformation journey. What are you seeing? Well, you know, I think it's really kind of interesting. Uh, you and I have had a lot of chats, you know, and, and like uh, a lot of folks, I enjoy cars. and I always kind of equate it to cars. So I think about computing today. The mainframe is just part of that, right? But the mainframe is so different today, it's so much more modern, so much more capabilities, you know, it's it's a bit like the automobiles. Nobody even thinks about comparing automobiles today to what it was 50, 60, or 80 years ago because they're ubiquitous. And computing today is just ubiquitous. And the mainframe today is that modern server that's more powerful than any other. And there's so much available in the technology for customers to take advantage of today to service their business in a variety of new and different ways. That it's just, it's just tremendously exciting. Well, I mean, you say cars there, I look at the analogy of the Porsche 911 or the Mustang. Both of those are around the same age as the mainframe platform. Exactly. But they are radically different. You know, we've got an electric Mustang there right. from Ford. You know, the electric 911's probably on the horizon yes. sometime soon. Those cars are radically different performance, you know, driving experience, technology that's in the car. Right. Fantastic analogy for, yes, it's still a Porsche 911, yes, it's still a Mustang, but it's so radically different and doing different things and operating in a different way, exactly the same as the mainframes had that over evolution over the last 60 years. So you mentioned we chat a lot, we get to the opportunity to connect. What are you seeing as you start to talk to customers as they're seeing their adoption of the platform kind of evolve. We're on a, what is it, 17, 18 year journey now with public cloud. We're starting to see data explode and we're seeing AI start to come through. What are some of those big themes? I know you chat to a sure. lot of your client base right. on a regular basis. Right. What are you seeing? You know, I, there, there are several things that I see. I'd say one, uh, you know, we talk about modernization. You hear modernization thrown all about, right? And I tend to think about it, maybe use a different phrase. It's not so much around modernization because we said the platform is modern. Yeah. You know, it's really about kind of transformation, right? So, you know, I hear customers talking about how they want to continue to evolve and transform how they're developing on the platform, how they're managing, operating it, securing it, mm -hmm. right? Those are things that they have been doing, as you think about it, for many, many years, but how do they continue to do it better? How do they do it differently, right? So we talk about DevOps transformations, and you and I have had those conversations, mm -hmm. but many customers are in different phases of their DevOps journey. What do we mean by that? Well, we mean simply that they're able to develop and deliver new capabilities to their business applications more frequently, with more capabilities, with higher quality, because they're developing agile practices and DevOps automation practices, and we help and support them in that effort. So that's kind of one transformational journey that we, we see. I would say another one is around how they really manage and operate the platform, right? Mm -hmm. They want to drive more automation. Why do they want to do that? Well, today's platform is very different than what it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. There are much more components. We're connected to the internet of things. So they want to make sure that they're automating as much of how they monitor, how they manage and keep up the high availability that's available with the mainframe. Tremendous amount of automation they want to deploy on that. They want to make sure they're using automation that is easy to use, that they're not writing all of these scripts and Rex languages and how do I use more modern things like Python, et cetera. So there's a variety of transformations that are occurring. 
So I'd say those are two big themes. Then the third theme I would mention is there's a lot of interest in how they can begin to think about and take advantage of newer capabilities, right? And I'll, I'll throw two things out there. So one, a number of conversations where customers are working today in the hybrid IT environment, mm -hmm. right? They have public cloud, they got private cloud, and they yep. have their on-prem data center. They're interested in how can I think about managing and operating my mainframe like a hyperscaler, mm -hmm. right? What might that look like, right? I, they talk about how I can roll changes throughout my uh, cloud platforms at a faster rate than I can across my mainframe platforms. Why is that so? How can I make it faster? And then the other area I would say is there's tremendous interest and buzz around generative AI, right? So that's very new, it's in its infancy, if you will, uh, but there's huge interest in how can I take advantage of that? So that's something that we rolled out, our first generative AI capabilities generally available last quarter uh, or early in January around our Z Advisor capabilities to help application development teams develop and deliver software faster, right? So those are some of the things that we see. You did well, John. Between us, we're recording this in 2024, and what, what are we, five, ten <laughs> minutes in before we mention generative AI? So, you gave me a great framework for the next few minutes there. Let's go developer first. We're seeing these big monolithic yep. sort of job uh, that people wanted to maybe take a transition, m evolve their COBOL. Right. Maybe they're looking to sort of maybe transition to other languages. They're looking to maybe uh, take that big monolithic application, understand it in more yeah. depth, and com turn it into composable right. kind of microservices, if you will. You guys are leading that from the front with your DevX portfolio. You talked about generative AI. I see that as a sort of cheat code for sure. the developer. Right. Talk to me about what you're seeing and what you're bringing to market there, because I think from we're seeing that general evolution. Yes. Business needs code faster, right, right. releases faster, you know, almost a daily, if not hourly, cadence now for code. Where do you see AI plugging into that? Yeah, I think there's uh, tremendous uh, applications for AI to help in that. Mm -hmm. And um, as I mentioned, we have the generative AI capabilities that are in our Z Advisor capability that help customers understand their metrics, what does that mean, where might they focus their improvement efforts to increase development velocity and quality. Uh, but the other area you mentioned, so we released a, a new product last year, Amy DevX Code Insights, that helps customers visualize mm -hmm. and understand these large, complex COBOL programs, right? So it's- And I think that's crucial. These, absolutely. These COBOL applications, these legacy applications, and, and I say legacy in the kind of, that's where they started, they're still supporting the business. They're big applications, mission critical, business Absolutely. depends on them Absolutely. every day. But people still want to evolve them, they still want to take them forward, they still want, the, a lot of the business rules are in right. there, they want to evolve them. And the way we, we talk about it is, look, you know, a, a developer wants to be able to make changes. There's a request, hey, we need to create this new capability, so they need to go in and change a program. But when you're dealing with a program that might be, and this is not uncommon for some of the whale programs that some of our customers have, it may be a million or multiple millions of lines of code. That would scare the bejesus out of me to have to go in there and change that. It's like, oh my gosh, I, I don't want to break anything. If it's all nested yeah. together, you've got exactly. to first understand it. So you have to you... first understand it, and that's what Code Insights helps you to do, and then it gives you the option to potentially refactor that into smaller callable services. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, if you can break that into many smaller programs, it's much easier to make changes with confidence. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to test the smaller component. Exactly. When it's easier to test a smaller component, it's easier to build test automation around the smaller component. So you see where this is going, right? By so breaking you, it down. You've got flywheels you, of exactly, innovation kicking exactly. in. But to come back to your question, so that that's already available in market for our customers today. Uh, and as we continue to have uh, design discussions with our customers, you know, the next area we see generative AI helping them is to use generative AI, one of the things it does is help just in natural language explain what it is I'm looking at. So can you just literally explain what this big complex program does? Give me a summary. Believe it or not, some of these programs aren't extremely well documented. Yes, COBOL is a natural language program, you can read it, but it's a bit like, you know what, 
I'd like the Cliff Notes version of this book. Yeah. I don't want to read every page it's, and chapter. Yeah, it's you know 20, what I mean? It's a million lines. Yeah, it's exactly. 20, 000, even in this service that we've composed, it's 20,000 lines of code. Exactly. What does that actually what does that do? do? Exactly. So part of it is understanding. Yeah. And then, as you said, uh, we have some customers that uh, absolutely are comfortable and love the COBOL language. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they want to refactor it and keep it in COBOL. We have some customers that said, look, I've got to move to Java. I'd like to be able to refactor it into Java. So maybe refactor it into other languages, Java or yep. Python. So we believe that generative AI can help us help customers achieve that, but at some scale. Uh, so that's uh, that's the area around the development process that we think is really interesting and a great application for the generative AI technology. The second theme you talked about was this kind of operational resilience. We're seeing a lot go on being driven out of the EU with Dora. Right. We're starting to see that ripple into US banks and international banks that operate in Europe. We're seeing kind of the whole threat landscape change, state, nation state actors right. from a security point of view. That landscape's can always dynamic. AI is starting to take a role in how operations teams work, alert fatigue, just those operations teams are just overwhelmed. You mentioned it earlier as well, the mainframes now more connected to everything else. So maybe wind back 10, 15 years ago, it was kind of siloed. It was an ETL kind of squirt overnight as a batch job, and the mainframe had done its work. It's now part of a connected hybrid cloud kind of maybe a data store that's serving lots of other downstream systems. How are you seeing kind of AI come through into that operations landscape? Yeah, I think there's a couple of areas, right? And I would break them down into one is around better observability, Mm -hmm. right, would be one area. And I think the other area would be related to more security and compliance. They're connected, but there are kind of two separate areas, if you will. So around the observability area, right, what we see, and we released uh, a product called Amy Ops Insight that helps customers identify, you know, proactively what might be some problem conditions around their applications, understanding what's normal and alerting to that. But more than that, we also, within Ops Insights, are able to do, at machine speed, root cause analysis. Mm -hmm. So again, systems are more complex. Uh, When you have more complex systems, there is a variety of different components that might be the root cause. This is where the classic, the old war rooms we would talk about. Now they're virtual, right? Say, hey, we got a problem. Can everybody check out their area, right? Who has the issue? Who has the problem, right? That's time consuming, labor intensive. And I don't think systems are that isolated anymore. The team, it's absolutely connected. a, A holistic view because the service is so complex and you call in on so many different things. It's not, oh, that's the mainframe team, that's the storage team, that's the distributed team any longer. I think those boundaries have broken down. And this is where AI can help, right? AI can help you understand the context. It can run at machine speed to look at all of those areas simultaneously and identify the one that looks like it has the longest path, right? Which one has the longest path that's impacting the most and then bring that to your attention. And then AI again, right, with some domain expertise built in, can offer what might be a couple of different root cause correction options. How do I repair this situation very rapidly? And I would say in the early stages, just like today, right, if you uh, use ChatGPT, check the work, right? Check the work. Here's a recommendation, and it's not meant to take it verbatim and go, it's meant, hey, here's a recommendation. Hey, review this uh, with a couple of your experts, but we may have really shortened the time to understand what the problem is and give you a really good push to what the potential root cause reaction might be. I've seen this error message five times before. Yeah. The team's taken this action four Absolutely. times out of five. I'm recommending you do this, but you're not doing the full automation to then go, I don't need an operator exactly. involved in the process. And I think for me, that's the key thing with generative AI. There's lots of kind of broader buzz about this is going to you know, get rid of people's jobs. Right. I just do not see it that way. I see it the kind of evolution of how we write. We've gone from a typewriter to of a course. word processor to spell checking to Grammarly 
to AI, it, it's a new powerful tool. It's an evolution. Tool. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So you touched on security as well. That's kind of the third big pillar, I think. That landscape, really scary for yeah. a lot of organizations. Mainframes typically hold in their crown jewels right. data. What are you seeing there? You know, there's a couple of things. I think within the security landscape, um, you know, it's about protection, right? Mm -hmm. You want to make sure you have the right protections in place within your environment. You know, we've long said, hey, the mainframe is the most securable platform. Yes. But I use this simple analogy. You know, I have locks on my doors and windows and I've got alarm system. But if I'm in a rush and I leave the house and I forget I was in the backyard earlier and I didn't lock the door, it's not secured, mm -hmm. right? Well, the mainframe with all these doors into it, as we talked about, it's open, more open than ever. You have to make sure that all of your doors and locks are set and that you've got the alarms watching, right? So one of the things is you want to make sure you have a more automated policy manager that knows about all of these back doors and windows and alarms and can alert you if you've got something that's not set that you should have set, right? So that's another area where AI can help around policy observability and management around a variety of security um, uh, uh, recommended uh, situations. I would say the other one would be around protection. Now it's kind of coming back into the observability. What are we seeing that's not normal, right? Do we see some activity that's unnormal? Do we see something that might look like uh, a hacking activity of some type? Um, so there's a variety of ways you might observe that. Again, machine learning can understand what's normal and say, hey, there's an abnormal behavior here, right? And bring that to your attention. And then finally, kind of coming back into what's the remediation, right? So if there has been an issue, how do I identify it? And how do I remediate that quickly? And how can I leverage automation to do that much more rapidly, right? So those are some of the things that we see. Um, and then I could go a little bit further and talk about what we see, especially in Europe now around the DORA, uh, Digital Operations Resilient Act, is that customers are having to show that they've got these third copy immutable copies that are in a different location, their primary, secondary, uh, and this is where our new Amy Cloud technology and Amy Cloud Vault is coming to the forefront and showing a number of customers this is a tremendous ability to leverage the hybrid IT environment uh, to have an immutable copy that's more safe than traditional, that doesn't require a mainframe sitting around it to process it, and you can restore back anywhere in the world uh, from an Amy Cloud Vault copy. Well, it's got, I'm glad you took me there because I was going to ask, I'm kind of, when is he going to get to Dora? When is he going to get to the immutable copies? I think that's relatively new technology. No, that's come in via acquisition. Where are you seeing the adoption? Are you, for me, that is just obvious. Yeah. Dora's driving the requirement. People have got to be required, compliant. What is it, January 25? Yes. Chatting to your team. They're starting to get the knock on the door. Right. People, are, the regulators are starting to sort of be vigilant in that space. It's not just European. Right. If you, if it, like GDPR is kind of it kind of spreads. It's kind of spread. Yes. If you're operating as a US based bank in Europe, you still got to be compliant with that regulation. Where are you starting to see that client adoption from the Amy Cloud? Piece? It's it's really picking up, mm -hmm. right? It's very much picking up, especially in Europe, but it's also picking up a little bit slower, but it is picking up in the US, yeah. right? And I think there's a, a couple of things there. I think one, um, you know, customers are recognizing that they absolutely must have this third immutable copy, right? Many organizations don't have that today. You know, they've got their, hey, I've got my backup process. I've got my disaster business continuity recovery process. But what happens if both of those are compromised? That's why you must have a third copy it, that is isolated from those two environments. That's the key point. It sounds Steve. like belt and braces, and you can kind of say, well, I've, got the, I've been doing backups. Before. Right. I've got my DR site. But for me, it's not around a resilience. I mean, resilience is part of it. But it's from that security perspective. You need a point you can go back to Absolutely. and go, I know this was good. That's the crucial thing for me. Right. You know that it's good and that you have access to it wherever you need access to it, yeah. right? That's the other key thing is that with the immutable copies, again, it doesn't have to reside in an environment where there's a mainframe to read and process it. All you need to do is point the mainframe that you're going to restore to 
to those copies and you can bring those back. Yeah. So John, a large part of BMC's portfolio is the mainframe, but I get briefed by the rest of your leadership team. There's a lot going on in the Helix portfolio and kind of more broadly than just where your business unit is. I think it'd be really interesting to sort of maybe talk about some of those connection points because as we said, the mainframe's more connected to those other platforms than it ever has been, both operationally, data flows, and sort of how it's how it sort of lives and operates as a core component of a hybrid cloud. What are BMC doing to kind of make those some of those connection points real for clients? Yeah, you know, I think um, when I, when I talk to to clients, uh, what they're interested in is running their entire environment, mm -hmm. right? Most of the executives that I get a chance to to work with and talk with, you know, they have responsibility for the entire hybrid IT environment, yeah. right? So what they're interested in is, you know, how does BMC help me manage the entire environment? So we have our BMC Helix solutions, which is you might think of them as everything that's not the mainframe, you know, your other on-prem or colo or cloud uh, environments. Our BMC Helix service operations give you operations and service management around that. Last year in that area, we released BMC Helix GPT, mm -hmm. right? So BMC Helix GPT can give you expert assist on incidents and problems related across your environment. We've integrated BMC Amy into BMC Helix and BMC Helix GPT. So BMC Amy is sending the mainframe information so that you have more of a holistic view of what a situation might be and what the resolution might be. So it's really giving you that generative AI expert assist natural language explanation of what the issue is and what the root cause might be as well, right? So that's a really uh, exciting area for us. You know, customers are very interested in how I can manage my entire platform. So from a BMC perspective, both Helix and BMC Amy plug into other environments. So it's not like you're locked into BMC because we want to make sure that, you know, we recognize custom, customers want more of that open borders approach. So. That's what we're doing in that area. Quite exciting and uh, great feedback from our customers who've been adopting the BMC Helix GPT capabilities. So as we start to th think about wrapping up here, John, we're at a moment in time with the platform. Where do you see it going forward from here? You, you With your sort of luminary status in the, in, and sort of leading one of the biggest teams, you've got people looking at the current products, you've right. got people looking at the next version, but you've... BMC invests heavily in R&D. Where are you seeing things going forward? So let's maybe get out of our yeah. kind of next release right. view. Sure. And maybe look ahead a little and see where the platform's going. You know, I, I kind of uh, hinted at that earlier, right? I think what you're going to see is the platform has long had just some tremendous attributes, and we've mm -hmm. talked about those forever, right? So we're talking about the availability, the throughput, the resiliency, the securability, all of those things, the abilities, right? Yeah. Um, but one of the things that the mainframe is not known for, right, it's not known for being the easiest platform to work with, right? Mm -hmm. um, the platforms that are, are the hyperscalers, right? Everyone sees, wow, how easy it is to be able to consume services, to be able to scale up and scale down, right? So I think what you're gonna see is this platform is gonna continue to evolve so that it has the great traits that many organizations depend upon but I think it was going to begin to take on the traits of the hyperscaler so that it's easier to consume and use and manage and operate and secure this platform like a hyperscaler. And I think as it evolves in that way, I think the adoption of the platform is going to continue to grow and uh, you know serve organizations around the world for many, many, many years to come. I'm seeing the exact same trend, this almost democratization of access and operations not lowering the bar, I don't want to describe no, it that way, not. but just making it easier for early stage professionals or people who are transitioning mid-career to get onto this platform and go, okay, these are just virtual machines, yep. this is just a development environment, okay, I'm orientated, I've got this, I can get involved and start to add value. I'm seeing that process accelerate, you know, I don't know. Was it five, six, seven years before a Sysprog was fully up right, to speed? Right. If you wound back, I'm seeing that whole process. Maybe because we're getting more open in the interfaces. Maybe the GUIs are simplifying. Maybe some of the, as you say, 
Cloud has given us a template to how would we should orchestrate these platforms. I'm certainly seeing that trend. Absolutely, and I think you know the other thing that I, I see is coming back to the GPT technology, right? I think GPT technology can help upskill and make uh, the earlier in career professionals. I won't say on an equal footing, but they will ramp up much faster than time their predecessors. Value. Their time to value is going to be shortened so much because of the uh, the expertise that'll be kind of at their side, helping them along the way. Well, John, that's a fantastic discussion. Fantastic to spend some time with you at this moment for the Mainframe platform. You've been watching the Mainframe Mini Summit brought to you by the Futurum Group. I'm your host, Stephen Dickens. There's lots of other fantastic spotlight sessions to check out, so please look for those, and we'll see you on the next episode.